the fourth annual Slow Living Summit, and thank you all for coming. Tonight, it's the, the next uh, two and a half days is an experiment, and we're very curious to see how you react to it, and we're looking forward to your feedback. Uh, for those of you who've been here in the past, you know that uh, we have tried to incorporate the arts into our Slow Living Summit, because the arts are so important. I do want to tell you that when I first uh, thought of doing the Slow Living Summit uh, four, four and a half years ago. It was because I saw um, and was introduced to Woody Tash, the founder of Slow Money. And every year, Strolling of the Heifers does something serious, and we have some sort of a summit. And I invited Woody uh, to come, where I met my dear friend, Kathy Berry. I don't know if she's here. And um, after uh, we, uh, a few of us, joined uh, and to uh, discuss the wonderful presentation that Woody did with slow money and slow food and that whole thing, I felt sort of helpless. This is all feels great, but what can I do as um, an individual? So a group of us got together, I presented it to them, and we decided why not invite all the slow minded people to come and create. Oh, is that Kathy over there? I want you to also uh, see my friend Kathy Berry, who has been with me in uh, promoting and um, discovering the Slow Living Summit. Kathy, say hi to everyone. Hi, <laughs> um, as well, so we got together and we talked about it and everybody was very excited. Then I went to uh, the president, Ellen McCullough um, Lovell, and told her about it, and she's amazing. And she was very excited about it. The one thing she said to me, make sure you incorporate the arts into it, which I tried to do each year. And I kept thinking about her words of wisdom. And each year we tried, the first year we had things at night, uh, the th second year we had them interspersed. Uh, last year, we actually did a brave thing and tried to cut out a lot of the speeches, and we had performances beforehand. And uh, folks really enjoyed that and felt that it helped them really process um, what they were learning and what they were feeling uh, with the arts involved. Well, this year, uh, we decided to really incorporate them. So we're really curious to see your thoughts on this. Um, so when I presented this to my very, very good friend, Linda, Linda McInerney, wherever she is, um, she immediately, her eyes lit up, and I uh, thought it was a great idea, but she took it further. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Linda McInerney, the Artistic Director of the Slow Living Summit. And what she has put together is unreal. Uh, you need to know that Linda is the founder and uh, the executive director of the Deerfield Production. And, and if you haven't seen any of her productions, you've got to go and see them. So without much ado, I'd like to present to you Linda McInerney. Welcome, everyone. It is so great to see you all here tonight. So, the reason I'm here tonight is because I love Orly Munzing. That's the reason. It really is. Jody, can we bring um, the next set of slides up so we can see that sweet little cow? I love the cow. I was trying to think of the perfect image to put up for you all. Um, what, to, would you like it to be louder? Can we get it a little bit louder then? I'll bring the mic a little bit closer to my mouth. There we go, thanks. Um, so I am here because I love Orly Munzing, everybody. I went out to dinner with her after my husband uh, introduced us um, when we were at, uh, I was at Flat Street Brew Pub, which actually is located right here in the gorgeous Latches Theater. Um, my husband and I are partners in that, and so you might enjoy a nice slow beverage at some point after 
Slow Living. So we were there, and we were having a beer, and we were talking about things, and she said, I have this secret idea, Linda, you can't tell anyone. And I was like, whoa, Orly, Mafia, what are we doing here? I didn't know what it could possibly be, and it was, it was the idea for the Slow Living Summit. And um, I'm a theater director. Um, I, I run a little theater company in Deerfield, Massachusetts. And so, unfortunately, for the first couple of years of Slow Living, I was doing gigs around and didn't get to come. But last year, I got to be here. So I went to the Slow Living Summit, and I went, and I thought, wow, there are so many amazing thinkers, and they're thinking such big thinking thoughts, and that's so brainy. And then, so I, I went out again for drinks with Orly Munzing um, at the Flat Street Brew Pub, which actually is located right here in the Lashes <laughs> Theater, where you might enjoy a nice slow beverage after, the, after this conversation. So I'm sitting with Orly, and, and I said, Orly, you know, yay, slow living. I said, but it's a little cognitive. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of like talking heads, heads and a lot of PowerPoint and they call them bullets for a good reason. And, you know, <laughs> and I, I said, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I think there's other ways of doing things where you can touch people's hearts in ways other than just sort of living in their prefrontal cortex. I think we could do something here. And she's, and, right? And do you love, here's what I love about Orly Munzing. Orly Munzing, rather than saying, well, you bitchy little wee wee wee. Orly Munzing says, of course you're right. You do it. So after I fell off my chair, picked myself up, I thought, well, that's just terrifying enough to really want to do it. <laughs> Scared out of my mind, fallen hard. So I really, honestly, you might think, I'm, well, actually, by the time this is done, I know you'll think I'm crazy. But um, I've spent the last year really thinking about how to do this in a really heartfelt way. So I started. The way I started was by reading every book I could grab about creativity and, uh, I know, I know, it's, I'm ill. And, and reading and reading and reading about how we receive information, how, what our hearts are like, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the heart's code, mind sight, all of these amazing amazing books about the way we take in information because it really I was really thinking that you know cognitive thought is what got us into this pickle in the first place and right did you hear that? yeah thank you cognitive thinking is what got us here in the first place it's that industrial revolution stuff it's that yeah, right right I'm hearing an amen out here I'm hearing an amen and so that right I love you for this so that so I was trying to think of how we get to that new story where we are interconnected where we are all together where we're caring for each other where we're caring for the earth, where we're caring for our planet, because it'd be awesome to survive as a species. <laughs> I'm for it. <laughs> so I, then I was thinking and thinking, okay, so the books, I've got the shelves, I've got the Kindle, off we go. And then I'm thinking, wait a minute, why don't I just do what I always do? Every time I either pick out a play because I think it's going to speak to humanity in this time that we live in, or any time I, I commission a new piece, I'm always just inundating myself with the characters and what their lives are like and what the story's about, and, and then I, I just live with them, and then I'm guided every step of the way. So what I did was, is I thought, well, we've got this incredible list of speakers. I don't know them, but they're all human. And so we asked them if they'd play. And here's what I want to tell you. Every darned, using my inside voice, every darned one of them said yes, they would love to play. So what I thought my next stop, step would be would be to get to know them. So I did things like I went to Hawthorne Valley in the middle of a snow swirl to meet with Martin Ping. You guys are so in love with Martin Ping you can't see straight. He created a world. There's a Martin Ping planet called Hawthorne Valley. It will change your life when you go there. There's a there's a there's a, a farm, multiple farms, all the houses he's built and renovated himself. There's a school. It's uh, there's a store. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful, intentional community that's been around for like 30 plus years, all from the heart of one being who's expanded his heart to become collective. I, I was blown away. And Martin Ping, you never saw a busier little Mr. Man. I mean, talk about the opposite of slow. 
So he spent the day with me because he was going to be a speaker at the Slow Living Summit. Really, I love him. And then, and he actually was my easiest guy because I said, so I'd love to integrate the arts. In, and, and I didn't even like that word integrate because I was like, integrate? Wait, art is everywhere. I mean, we're all human beings. We're all artists. Everything, we, we, we sing when we, where birds sing. Birds are the most awesome composers you ever saw in your life. And we sing when we plant and we dance when we reap and we carve butter churns, you know, we just, art is, art is, we are art. So I asked Martin Ping, I said, so how would it be best to incorporate, I still use that word, I'm letting it go though, how would it be best to incorporate the arts into your plenary session? And he said, oh, well, you know, I've raised this whole family of musicians because uh, they've all been through my school throughout their entire lives. So I'd love to just work with my, my band that I always work with, uh, and they'll just play with me because they're used to improvising with me, and that's what we always do. Check. And then I got to thinking, and I really screwed up. I screwed up so badly with Charles Eisenstein, who's here tonight. So Charles Eisenstein, okay, so learning about all the peeps. Have you seen A Scent of Humanity? It's 1,200 pages long, okay? It's a boat anchor. So I read A Scent of Humanity twice so I could really receive it and really understand Charles's worldview. And I found this little piece in there where he quoted an, an, improv, an acting improv book that I knew about. I was like, oh man, I'm going to make a whole acting improv thing around Charles Eisenstein. And then I was like, I'm just throwing a pie in my own face. That's the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. So then I had another idea and I failed miserably again with my girlfriend Lori Holmes Clark, who is a beautiful Broadway dancer who married a fourth generation apple farmer. You love her, she's gorgeous. And I met with her and we read together from A Scent of Humanity and the More Beautiful World We Know is Possible. And we danced and we talked and we sang and we made up stuff and she said, Linda, this is just wrong. You need a cellist. <laughs> I was like, what? And I was like, okay, cellist? And I was like, duh. Where on earth is there the most beautiful, heart-stopping, shake your soul to your toenails cellist? Right? Friesen. Eugene Friesen. Right? Duh. Duh. So I've put these two beautiful boys together, and I'm just getting the hell out of the way on that one. And then, um, so then, and then there's, uh, oh, here's my favorite one. Can I tell you how I feel, after feeling really stupid, can I tell you when I felt really smart? I felt really smart on this one. So Amit Sharma, okay, he is uh, an economist, but he uh, has found just this brilliant way of reforming the construct of economy, uh, the, the, just the way we do uh, uh, the capitalist economy. Economy. Amazing stuff. I had to read his stuff like six times because uh, I was trying to get it, but you know how that is. So I got it, and then I was like, you know what? No dancing. No, no wiggling around. What this one needs is some charm and some wit and some illustration. So I got uh, in touch with my girlfriend, Amy Jonquest, who, aka the Banner Queen, who has been painting freak show and sideshow banners for the last 30 years. I love her work. She's whimsical. She's crazy. She twists language in the most amazing ways and I asked her if she'd play and she said yes and now here's what you need to know people you need to know that Amy Jonquist painted 17 whimsical delightful illustrations about how we can be in the new economic construct in our world and they're all for sale for hundred and fifty dollars you all want one and this will change her life because as an artist hundred and fifty dollars can change the planet for you and I know that there are a lot of amens that are starting to happen just on that one so okay so if you can't afford it it's fine but if you can go ahead and get one okay and then um, and then there's um, my own which is going to be something that uh, you'll see uh, a, a friend who is part of the one that I'm going to do on Friday which is I'm going to share with you my own creative uh, process is just five words that guide me in my creative life and in um, and recently in my lifey life life and it's been really really good 
Really good. So I'm going to share that with you just to see if you'll connect with that in any way. And then I'm going to give you um, a show that uh, I collaborated on with my dear friend John Sheldon. It's a show called The Red Guitar, and that'll be on Friday night. But the thing that's going to happen now, in just a minute after you meet my friend Erica Wheeler, um, the thing that's going to happen after Erica Wheeler is another one I feel pretty smart about. So this is, and many of you, if you're local people, you know Samantha Eagle. Uh, who runs Biologic, if you know, I mean, you don't. Okay, anyway, amazing human being. She is. Uh, she has studied Western medicine and has a doctorate in that world and has also studied natural medicine and traditional medicines and has created a bridge. And she travels all over the country like a crazy person. I'm telling you, these slow living people are the fastest living people I ever saw in my life. It's nuts. It's nuts. So she travels all over the country guiding physicians into bridging uh, that that world so that they can uh, create healthy lives rather than slamming a drug on a busted one. So she's a really amazing person. So here was my thought on that. So my thought on that was, how about if I invite my friend Lyndall Hart, who I actually have commissioned to write uh, new pieces, as a side note, but I have uh, commissioned a new piece based upon Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, again, to have us begin to tell that new story, because she told the cautionary tale of what would happen if science and ego and power and hubris or stepped their bounds and, create, and, and left heart and love and humanity behind. And I had in mind uh, uh, to to do it in a way that it has a frame for now. Lyndall Hart is the writer of this piece, and he's also playing the creature. We, we do the piece through the point of view of the creature. And I thought, what if I get Lyndall Hart to connect and move with Samantha Eagle? And then what if I get my dear friend John Sheldon to create a cushion and a, and, a, and a feather bed of sound underneath them. What would that be like? And then I've got another little trick that I'm not even going to tell you about uh, because it'll, it'll astonish you, um, and I wanted to keep it a surprise. And Jody, can we move to the next slide, which is that beautiful Vermont slide? Thanks, sweetheart. Um, and so now I want to tell you the next thing that's going to happen. I'm going to shut up. And I'm going to bring out somebody who you may already know. If anybody came to the summit last year, you met the amazing Erica Wheeler, who, re right? There's an amen there. There's an amen. There's a clap. Yeah, right? Let's say that. And Erica Wheeler did a thing where she crowdsourced a song, and it was just beautiful. And now I'd love Jody to go to that next slide, which is uh, the thing, the John Muir uh, quote. And I put it on a picture that was taken from space, which that's another one. How about that? When you look at the earth from away and you realize how connected we all are and who we all are together. So Erica Wheeler is going to come out here in just a second, uh, and she's going to create a song for you. She's going to share with you a song that she wrote and she, uh, in the past, and she's going to share with you a song that she actually wrote for this event. She just did it for you. And that one, would you change the slide one more time? Jody, thanks so much, sweetie. That's, this one is an idea that I had, and I'm going to play with you. This is my big experiment. This is an experiment in getting to have you feel one another. There's an old Chinese uh, parable or pro proverb that you know we are all connected by thread and the thread can get tangled and the thread can be moved around, but in the end we are all connected and it's just a beautiful thought. It actually came from Martin Ping uh, when I was uh, talking to him on, the, on a conference call uh, over a year ago. He told me about this and I thought, wow, that's a beautiful image. So what I'm gonna do for you after Erica comes out, I've got a big ball of yarn that, yeah? And Martin, um, Martin Langefeld's wife is a knitter and a bit of a hoarder. Yikes. Um, and he said that he had plenty of red thread for me to make a big ball of thread. And so during the song, I'm actually going to begin with you. You want to hold the end of the red thread? I love you for that. Thanks. And then we're going to do the ball back and forth and back and forth 
and back and forth, and even, even over to here and over to here. And so um, you'll all be connected by a little piece of thread, and you're even going to hold on to it through Samantha Eagle's piece. She's going to ask you to do some crazy stuff. Don't worry, you don't have to take your clothes off or anything. Well, maybe. Well, we'll see. We don't know. Um, but just whatever it is she asks you to do, do that with the thread in your hand, and then we're going to try and experiment with that thread at the end of the entire conference. So now, here we go. Here comes Erica Wheeler. She's going to come out right now, and you're going to feel something really beautiful, friends. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for playing in our experiment. Thank you. Fabulous. So, as you heard, she's created a wonderful program for all of us. All of, all of the people working on this have created it, but she's been an inspirational force, and so we're, we're excited. The moment is now here. And um, I think it's so interesting that this is the fourth. Um, I feel like it's... Um, I'm doing things a little differently. I think we're all going to be doing things a little differently. I think that's the theme of this time and the theme of uh, what we're doing here. Um, so I want to start, I'm going to do three pieces, and I'm going to start with a song that I've recorded that is, um, I think now that I was thinking about it for this, it's more about where, where we've come from. <laughs> Not as much as where we are. It's about someone who might have sold their farm and regretted it. And I wrote this song in 2008, 2007, 2008, and I dedicated it to all the people who provided alternatives to selling off the family farm. Um, it's about someone who, who's a character that I thought of that might have sold the farm that some of the housing developments on the Connecticut River are. And I thought about what if she sold that farm and, and regretted it? Um, and so I wrote this song from that from that storyline. Um, but I think that's I think of all the I think there's so much well, there's so much advancement in us um, restoring agricultural land and creating a new agricultural economy. And so this goes to that doing things differently spirit now. Down comes a fall in a soft summer rain. Falls on the cornfields of this river flood plain. It falls on the green hills and the roadside stands. Where you pay leaving money in an old coffee can. Pass the broken gas pumps and the barn falling down. There's a swimming hole where the river's fat and round. Good summer rain There's more people moving in and They all need a home And they put up stores and houses In the fields that I had known On the richest soil You're ever gonna find Traffic backs up now most all the time so your children won't know it the way I did up the river road how I used to live and that farm it still haunts me but just like it's calling out my name don't it seem like a waste of Summer rain It's almost time for second planting I can feel it in the air How I wish I'd never sold that place Now there's just asphalt everywhere Far. 
terms of the way life's always been And that farm, it still haunts me Like a waste of good summer rain. Don't it seem like a waste of good summer rain? Thank you. Thank you to all the amazing work that's been done in this room and beyond to uh, provide alternatives to selling off the farm and going forward with um, taking care of what we have to take care of today. And so in that spirit, I wanted to, I was just, I was thinking about what I wanted to sing today and this song I used to sing came to mind um, and it seemed perfect for this moment. Um, it's a poem by Maya Angelou. And it was originally put to music by Ben Harper. He does a much slower version. Um, I tried to make it into a rap song, um, <laughs> sort of a white Jewish rap song. Um, so this is, my, this is my rap song. But it'd be fun if um, you wanted to clap along. The spirit of participation. But I just thought the, the poem is called And Still I Rise. And um, in the poem, she references um, things that mean a lot. She says, she speaks about diamond mines and gold mines and oil wells as being the commerce of, you know, what's so valuable. When she uses her voice, when she steps up, when she walks into herself, her true self, she, she, she has that value. And so I thought about, you know, maybe I could change it and I could say, you know, I've got solar panels in my living room, but it just didn't seem the same thing. It just, I think it's a symbol of, um, of uh, whatever it is that we are holding that is our commerce that isn't about the monetary value, it's about the power that it brings us. Does that make sense? Is that gonna work for you guys? You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. Draw me down in the very dirt, but still like the dust I'll rise. Up from those shacks of history, shame. Up from a past rooted in pain. Yes, I'll rise, I'll rise, I'll rise, rise, rise. Does my happiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I laugh like I got a diamond mine breaking up in my front room. So you may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, but I'll rise, I'll rise, I'll rise, rise, rise. Does my confidence upset you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I walk like I got a diamond mine right there in my front yard. So you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. Draw me down in the very dirt, but still like the dust I'll rise. Up from those shacks of history shame. Up from a past rooted in pain Yes, I'll rise, I'll rise, I'll rise, rise, rise So you may write me down in history With your bitter, twisted lies Try me down in the very dirt But still like the dust I'll rise And does my happiness upset you? Oh, don't you take it awful hard Cause I walk like I got a gold mine right there in my front yard so you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies draw me down in the very dirt but still like the dust i'll rise from those shacks of history shame or from a past rooted in pain yes i'll rise i'll rise i'll rise 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 Yes, I'll rise, I'll rise, I'll rise, rise, rise. Thank you, Sister Maya Angelou.
cheering section. She is my own personal cheering section. We've had some really wonderful, juicy conversations about all this. On the, oh yeah, the beautiful mountain. I didn't know there was trails there. That's so funny how you drive by a place and um, then you walk it with a friend and suddenly that place always looks different to you. You can see it where the ski thing is. <laughs> Uh, cheers. Everyone have water? I'm going to have a sip of water. Um. So I want to write a song with you guys. And what, you know, traditionally what I like to do is sort of go through the history of a place and talk about the place and um, what's shaped this place, the nature and the history that has shaped this place and the people that have come in the succession of time and to kind of create a narrative, a story of, of this place and our time together here. Um, so I was thinking about that and um, the start being the beginning of the conference. Um, and I wanted to just sort of set us on a path and then, and then we're going to op open it up to some ideas from you guys. Um, but I was thinking about this place. Last time I was here and I had researched about it and I had really come to understand it as a place that is a crossroads. Um, a crossroads of the Great River and of the railroads and the north and south roads, the east and west roads. And it felt like the gathering of us here was also the representative of a crossroads. So I was kind of pulling off that theme. And the way some of you, some of you like to write, I'll just tell you the way I like to dive into any piece of writing is to just um, root myself in the place where the story takes place, right? So, um, so that's what I do. I just sort of set us off with a verse or two like that. <laughs> I just wrote it today in my pajamas in my living room. So it is, uh, it is just for the moment. It's not. I know it's not for. It's it's in. It's like the spring flowers. It's ephemeral. It's it's here because the leaves were not yet on the trees and the sun was shining and it was the right day for it to bloom. So. <laughs> And I want to say it's, in, uh, it's with all due respect to Robert Johnson. <laughs> Where the whetstone river runs down That once powered up these mills Where the railroad crosses I can hear it whistle still Where the old brick buildings curve down streets where the green mountains rise and the great river meets well I went down to the crossroads and I did not sell my soul I went down to the crossroads and I emerged more whole Where there once was a straight line And they'll ask how that happened overnight We'll say it took its slow, sweet time We went down to the crossroads And we did not sell our soul No, we went down to the crossroads We came out feeling whole for the thread. <laughs> well, I took the north and the south road, east and the west road, and I pulled on a long red thread, and this is now what I know. There once was a straight line, there's a circle for us here. 
So this is the idea. So there's this thread that Linda's passing around that's going to sort of bond us together. Is it organic cotton? It, it's wool from a real lamb, people. A real lamb coat. <laughs> that's awesome. So what I want to hear from you is something that you saw today on the way in, or a line of something that you thought about on the way in, or something that you were, were thinking about or feeling, and if you could do it maybe with an image, like if you saw the evening sky against the red brick and wondered who you'd meet inside, or something like that. And I'm going to write it down and try and patch it into this song. So just popcorn style. Is this thing still going on? Yes, good. <laughs> That's perfect. That's amazing. There's no drum roll. <laughs> Who has a, um, an idea they want to add? It's the creative pause. <laughs> In the building with the stars on the ceiling I just want you to open up and tell me how you're feeling <laughs> Oh Can the mic get turned on? Oh, there we go. So, uh, testing, testing Yeah? Okay, so I met a new friend on the train who was coming to the same conference. Nice. You took the train up? Yeah, took the train up from Baltimore. I like that, see? Robert Johnson would like with, that, too. With slow internet. <laughs> I took the train up from Baltimore. I met some friends going to the same conference. There was slow internet, but the rails were fast. <laughs> 99 bottles of beer on the wall. <laughs> I know. All right, there's an orange. I'm going to write this. Was it that was a spray painted one? Yeah. Is that the is that the one that we're like we're okay? Just yell it out really, I'll hear you. The room is kinda hot. Patches of blue sky poking through the clouds, lighting my way from St. Johnsbury. Driving up here looking at my two sons sleeping in the car. I, I drove up a green valley with my love and across the longest kissing bridge, the covered bridge in Vermont. <laughs> okay, now... Um so, so, okay, so these are the arrival stories, which are all beautiful and I love. And so I want to hear a line or two about once you arrived, like, what did you see? Just shout it out. I guess the mic, we don't need it. I saw that the Brattleboro Food Co-op, for which I had painted a mural with a frog many years ago when I left Brattleboro, had moved, expanded, and even had a building with a community kitchen for community cooking classes. All right. Two, one, one more like arrival story. Just yell it out. Okay. 
And then, do you have a hope or thought about um, what you want to gain, what you want to see happen from being here? Or something you envision, the world that we are creating uh, happening? I see. You could just say, I see, I see. See great spirits? Oh, sp kindred spirits? I envision a world where we won't see homeless people in the richest world in the country. Go ahead, just share. <laughs> Do you know, Lucy Caplancy has a song about the red thread. Do you know that song? Do you guys know that song? I don't want to try and top it. She's awesome. All right, was there one more? Okay, go ahead. that. Thank you. That's great. So this is our little sand painting, our little Tibetan painting that is just this moment. So thank you. Um, we could go on and on like this. It's beautiful. Could have just done that, right? On the train from Baltimore, I met you. You were going there. It was a fast trail and a slow internet as we speeded through the air. And she was driving down the long green valley. She passed someone giving a long, deep kiss. She was, he was driving with his sons asleep. We were heading towards this. And she woke to the sound of warblers. She woke to a cooing dove. And she looked up at the patch of sky when she left today. And the irises greeted her. meeting like old friends again and sometimes we're like a turtle going slow down the super highway we want to plant our fragile legs we're heading towards that field we're risking our lives these soft white eggs that we know bring the future life because it's a beautiful evening in Brattleboro on the start of this slow living adventure it's just the beginning of a conference to remember Erica Wheeler, one more time. Come on, come on. Thank you so much. Get this in between. That was great, wasn't it, friends? I'm just going to tuck this to the side. And that was.
As you're Erica Wheeler, you feel it? Come on, do you feel it? Right? That's the idea. We just want you to feel it. So now is your next adventure. Your next adventure is Samantha Eagle. And I really should get my little bio because I don't know so many facts about her, though we are soulmates now forever, but I don't have much history with her, so I have to read a little bit of it off. Samantha Eagle. I know that she went to UVM. I know that she studied medicine. I know that she actually got a doctorate in, uh, in, at uh, the University of Bridgeport. I know she spent her summers on farms. I actually know she followed the Grateful Dead for a while back in her youth, so we have a little bit of that in common. And she runs an amazing organization, an amazing company called Biologic here in Brattleboro, where you can go to Samantha Eagle and work on being a healthy, whole person rather than sticking a Band-Aid or a drug down your throat to stop some kind of anguish, you know? That's, that's the other one we need to work on, right, friends? The whole drug thing is really, really big. So she runs that company here in Brattleboro, and she's going to be accompanied by two exquisite artists who are actually longtime dear friends of mine. Lyndall Hart is going to be moving with her, and Lyndall Hart runs an organization, uh, runs a company, Hart Yoga. He's a yoga instructor and has been for a long time. He's also a performer, uh, and he's also a great writer, and he's an amazing human being. And like I said, he will be performing uh, in the piece that he is writing called Frankenstein. Einstein, and then uh, accompanied also by the exquisite John Sheldon, a virtuoso guitarist who uh, has had forays into the institution of rock and roll and decided to come back and live slow with you babies. So here we are. I'm going to move this, um, this aside, and I'm going to invite out Samantha Eagle. Samantha, come on out, baby girl. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Hello, everybody. Um, hi. Oh, made it here. Um, so I have to first say that I feel a little bit vulnerable, um, and I'm just letting you all know that. Um, I am very accustomed to speaking to crowds. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you. A lot of love and support around here. So. Um, I would love to share with you all a little bit about myself and how I got here. Speaking of vulnerability, I'm accustomed to speaking to large crowds. I am honored in that I have been asked to um, be a presenter at lifestyle medical conferences around the country. And I'm going to be sharing with you some of the tidbits about lifestyle medicine. In those conferences, I generally speak to large groups of clinicians or physicians. And uh, I present for about six hours. So really, the next hour and 20 minutes um, should be a breeze. Hopefully, it won't feel like six hours to you or to me. <laughs> I grew up on Long Island, uh, which um, I heard a yay there for Long Island. Wow. Um, and Unlike a lot of people who grew up on Long Island, I obviously did not get the accent, and I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> but I can snap into it at any time, so if I start getting a little tired or uh, uh, more nervous than I am right now, I may come up with a Long Island accent. <laughs> but I grew up um, in a beautiful community on Long Island. When most people think of that area, they think of the high hair, they think of long nails, and uh, a lot of consumerism. But when I was growing up on Long Island, it was beautiful farmland. And um, everywhere, we lived on the North Shore, uh, about 60 miles out from uh, New York City. Uh, in New York world, that means you're about two hours from the city. And uh, my father was a physician, and my mother was a scientist, a teacher, and... Um, just a, an amazing woman. And very early on in my life, unfortunately, my mom developed a debilitating inflammatory disease. And during that time, I was very, very young. I had no concept of health or anything. I was just 
being a happy child. And my parents did the best that they could to raise both my sister and I with a consciousness. And my mom, as the wife of a physician and a scientist herself, went through all of the natural course, courses that people do when they've just been diagnosed with a debilitating disease. And my mother took her medication, and she did what she was told to do, but unfortunately, she wasn't improving. She wasn't feeling better. And as the medications increased, they actually had to start prescribing medications to mitigate the side effects of other medications. And she stepped back and she said, okay, I have two young children here, what can I do? And back in the late 70s, early 80s, there was a shift that was happening, certainly within our food source. And my mom and my father used to drive out to the east end of Long Island to the organic farms there. Sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback and clicking. I don't know if that's something that we can... Would you like me to... Uh... It's... <laughs> Let me check. A loose circuit, I think. Is, is it the battery pack or is it me? Okay. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, I, I actually don't even need a microphone. I could probably project to all of you at this point. But um, So she started putting it together that... I'm, I'm tied in. <laughs> Hold on. I will get this. I'm going to... Okay, let's, let me see how this is with me holding it, yeah. and we'll see how. Okay. So, oh. <laughs> what, uh, what we started putting together, what she started putting together, was how she was feeling after eating certain foods. And that was a very profound connection she started making. And that there were certain foods that made her condition worse, and there were others that made her feel better. And so even though she was not at her best, she was able to find those foods that were nourishing to her. And again, my sister and I went along with it. And uh, there was not a lot of refusal of food in our household because it was quite a bit of energy just to create that for us, to get that food. So I had a lovely childhood, but like most kids, I rebelled a little bit. And um, I, my form of rebellion was actually not going to school so much. I uh, lived in New York at a time when they actually allowed open campus. Kids could come and go. And so when I was in high school, yes, I did go on tour with the Grateful Dead. And I would show up, hand in a paper, take a test, and then go off again. I also volunteered for an organization, or it was actually an after-school program uh, run um, by one of the teachers, and the, the club was called Hunger, Poverty, and Homelessness. And so when I wasn't going to school, it wasn't that I was doing horrible things, I was actually volunteering on, on an organic farm with a gentleman who, um, in the middle of suburban Long Island, created an oasis. And after one of a, a devastating hurricanes somewhere down in Central America, he invited the entire community to bring food to his farm, and he would ship it off um, in, a, in big crates. And he did that, but the food kept coming in. And he started noting that people in the community, in this community of ours, were hungry, and they were in need. So he created a, a no-questions-asked soup kitchen and food bank. And so students would show up, we would help stock things, we would make sure that the items on the shelf were okay for consumption. And I got very involved with the farm there. And th the farmer's idea 
as this became more and more obvious that people were hungry and that the foods that they were eating were perhaps not nourishing them, was to teach people how to farm. And so he started collecting bags to um, contain his compost. From the compost, he would ask for collections of seeds or teach people how to harvest seeds. And then he ran free classes to anybody in the community to teach them how to grow their own food. And I love this. This is what I did when I skipped school. So my mother wasn't entirely devastated with my, uh, with my um, work ethic there. Well, that went long well. Grateful Dead. I ended up at the Putney School. So I, I went to boarding school. Um, and the fact that I was able to just show up to school, take a test, or um, hand in a paper, and I still had straight A's, uh, they knew something was going on. And at Putney School, for those of you who are not familiar with that school, perhaps you should be, especially when you're in this area, um, visiting this area. But again, I found my element on the farm and working with the food and working in the garden and working with the animals. Um, as Linda mentioned, I did go to University of Vermont. Um, I was a biology student to start and then decided somewhere through the, my first year, my freshman year, that I was interested in sociology and women's studies. That if I was going to take my studies further, I was going to have to go back to graduate school anyway. I might as well just get the lens for, um, for viewing the world. So that's just a snippet. And I know many people in this audience, and perhaps they don't even know that that is my background and that I'm from Long Island, and, and that is how um, I at least got to Vermont. I am a naturopathic physician and nutritionist now, and I run an integrative medical practice, and I am very passionate about education. The term doctor comes from the Latin docere, which means to teach. And for me, I take that very seriously. When I was first approached to present to the slow, at the Slow Living Summit, it was October of 2013. And I received um, an email from Orly Munzing. And um, let me just say, when you get an email, a personal email from Orly Munzing, you reply. Because this woman is such a visionary, she is so she has so much energy for what she does, and whatever Orly is doing, I kind of want to take part in. And she put together a small group of us to sit down, and they uh, mentioned to me that they were interested in doing a, the Slow Living Summit on health, healing, wellness, wealth, all of that. And knowing some of the work that I was doing, would I be interested in presenting? And of course, I said, yes, I, I would. And so I signed on the dotted line in October. A couple of days later, I received an email, follow-up with a couple of links on it. And the links were to a YouTube video. And that YouTube video was a scientist, a choreographer, who had a novel idea. And his novel idea is that we do away with PowerPoint presentations. That there's another way of presenting information in a dy dynamic way. And so I looked at the video and I was mesmerized. I was absolutely blown away by these, these doctorate students dancing their dissertations. And I was so excited and I said, yes, I'm definitely in. And I said, great, we're gonna pair you with an artistic director and we're gonna do all this and we'll talk about it as it develops and we'll go for it. I said, okay, this is great. And then I realized I don't dance. <laughs> so um, this is definitely out of my comfort zone. <laughs> But, and I'm, I'm also suspecting that for a lot of us, this may be slightly out of our comfort zone as you sit there with a red thread. I knew I had to participate though, because when I was in college and when I was starting to become more active with the environmental movement on campus, uh, I was working, um, I was this, the student president of Global Links, which looked at more um, issues of hunger, poverty, and homelessness on a global level. The thing that drove me crazy is that I was passionate about so many things, and yet I was only one person. 
and it hasn't changed much since college. But the mantra that I've always used was the John Muir quote. When you pick out something, and there's variations, <laughs> when you pick out something by itself, you find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So if I could just see, the, I, I was not able to see from backstage, who has the ends of the red thread? Can I see? So we have one back there, and the other person who has the other end? The beginning is down here. Okay, so it's not a person. But recognize, oh, I'm sorry, the beginning's down here. I thought someone was, someone was, <laughs> Sir, I'm very sorry. <laughs> so, person in the back here, this gentleman up in the front, you are all connected. When you pick out something by itself, you find it hitched to everything else. And as a provider, I take solace in that. I take solace in knowing that if I can affect change in one way, it's going to affect many other things. So, how's everyone doing? I can't see you back there, but um, perhaps it's feedback. Um, the next part of my presentation to you is talking to you all about the well-being. And I want to introduce the well-being to you. And fortunately, I have two friends that can join me on stage. The well-being is nutrition. This is nurturing. This is what we take into our bodies and how we process those nutrients. I represent activating, activity, and exercise. And my other friend, who represents the transformation of stress. And together, we are the pillars of the well-being. We are what hold the well-being up. And without those pillars, without that support, nothing we build on top of that will function optimally. So for the next part of our conversation here, we're going to really dive into the well-being. We're going to talk about what it means for nourishing. And not just, again, the foods that you take in, but the much larger picture of it all. When I think about nutrition, there's many elements to it. There is the farmer, hopefully, that is making the food, growing the food, who is in relationship with that food at all times. One of the, my favorite quotes that I heard recently is, if the food is a plant, it's food. If it comes from a plant, it's not food. And we can become very myopic about things. We can look at the small components, or we could just talk about the politics, the environment, as it pertains to our nutrition and nurturing. But we can't forget that the food that we put in has a very specific interaction in our bodies. I'm learning more and more about something called functional medicine. And people ask me, well, what is functional medicine? 
It's the opposite of dysfunctional medicine to begin with. And I'm sure all of you at some point have had some interaction with dysfunctional medicine. In my work, people often come to me in great stages of stress and despair. They're feeling the most depleted that they've ever felt. Oftentimes they come with a chart that's already this thick because they've been everywhere. They have a myriad of symptoms and they have been through every to every single specialist and they've been given a medication for everything that's been going on with them. So the example that I would like to give is an individual who has recently been told that they have blood sugar dysregulation. They are pre-diabetic. One thing I would like for you all to do in this room is look to your right, look to your left or behind you, and recognize that this moment, one out of three Americans have prediabetes or diabetes. Which one are you? The scary part of that is that only 7% of Americans actually know it. So if this entire room, 300 seats, was filled, that means that only 100 people would, would have prediabetes, but only 21 of them would actually know it. And these things don't just happen overnight. This is a process. And in functional medicine, what we start to look at are the processes by which things are taking place. People don't just wake up one day and have type 2 diabetes. But you would think the way that our medical system is structured right now, that that's what was actually happening. You go to the doctor, if you're aware. Most of my, my patients are um, female, by the way. It's pretty typical in practices. And the men that come in have either been dragged there by their female partner, or something in their male world is not working optimally for them and they now feel um, a special uh, impetus to go and see the doctor. But a patient can come in year after year to most doctor's offices, and they're fine. They get their height, their weight, their blood pressure. Oh, Mr. Jones, your, your blood pressure is up a little bit more this year than it was last year. Perhaps your weight is up a little bit more. Why don't you eat better, move your body, and come back in a year and we'll see how you're doing. And lo and behold, that individual goes away, they get part tied up with their life and what's going on, and all of a sudden, it's time to go see the doctor again. They have their blood work done, their blood pressure's taken. Well, Mr. Jones, we got your blood work back, your blood sugar level is up, your triglycerides are up, your blood pressure is way up from last year, and your belt size is up too. You have type 2 diabetes. But you're going to continue to eat better and exercise, right? And here's a prescription for you. Does that sound pretty familiar to what's happening? Do people resonate with that? So what I don't want to, I know it's uh, late on a, Wednesday evening, and I always like to bring this to not only the medical side, but also the economic side of things. Because what we're doing right now as a society is not sustainable. And we all know that, and that's probably one of the reasons that many of you are here. I have the opportunity to talk to physicians about healthcare economics, and most of them are not even aware of the numbers. And I would like to just impart to you very briefly the information about that individual. 
So Mr. Jones was healthy. And in the national average, I think my, got it? Okay, I'm, I'm off. Uh, <laughs> um, I will just project as much as I can here. Oh, I, you can hear me? Okay. Um, so, oh, okay. So Mr. Jones has been healthy. He's been contributing. He's been either buying insurance or his company is contributing to the insurance. The general individual, uh, the, the average individual in this country spends about six to $8,000 on just buying their own insurance. And that's for a healthy person. And for many of us, we go, boy, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money and I'm not using that much of it. So what's happening here? So we have Mr. Jones who's been going for his routine annual checkups. Everything is okay, right? All of a sudden, he's just been given that diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. When he went from being healthy, the average cost per month for his care was $200. And that's just going to the doctor once a year, having his lab work, perhaps being sick once, getting a medication. That cost $200 a month if you, you um, put it out by the month. So $2,400 for a healthy individual. Mr. Jones just received the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. He's given a prescription that will lower his blood sugar level and perhaps another one for his blood pressure. The cost doesn't go up that much. It goes up only to about $300 a month. Okay, Still, it's a little bit more than most of you are probably aware that you're spending but we're all supporting Mr. Jones, those of us who are healthy and putting money into the system. What do you think happens when something acute occurs? So Mr. Jones goes from being a type two diabetic, getting his blood work done on a regular basis, taking his medication, seeing his doctor, and then something happens. Heart attack, what else? So cardiovascular disease, what was that? Renal, Renal failure, come on, what is that? Stroke, what else do you think happens? What are the main cost drivers in our insurance model? Depression, Depression mood, accident, musculoskeletal issues, right? Knee pain, hip problems, low back pain. Third one, cancer. Cardiovascular disease, musculoskeletal disease, and cancer. Mr. Jones just went from costing $300 a month to $4,000 a month. That's where our problem is. And it all starts on a cellular level. It all started on such a microscopic view, but we forgot to notice what was happening as it was happening. So here's where I want you all to go with this for a moment. We're just going to slow down for a second. And I want to talk about this. We have a beautiful cell here. We have a cell that is working to function optimally within our system. And depending on what we put into that system, it's estimated we have 37 trillion cells in our body. And each one of these is a community working together. The nucleus of the cell, where our genetic material is held, 
the mitochondria, which produces the energy for our cells. This beautiful cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, that is holding all of this and creating a very delicate balance within the body. When we change anything about the what our cells are being bathed in, our body has to react to that. I often inform my patients about this cellular membrane and the importance of this. And tying it back to what all of you are probably slightly familiar with is the change in, that's gone on in our environment and our food source as we have moved to this more industrialized way of being. And in the past 50 years, one of the most profound things that has happened is that we have taken the cows that were in the pasture, we have put them in pens, and instead of feeding them a steady stream of dark leafy greens, that grass, we are giving them corn, GMO corn most likely. And for any of you, if you sat around all day being fed a steady stream of corn, what do you think would happen in your body? Versus eating grass. And that cell membrane, which is a beautiful, fatty layer that creates this homeostasis, becomes compromised. We talk about the essential fatty acids in the diet. They are essential because our bodies cannot produce them from nothing. We need to take them in. People often will go out and say, okay, I, I you know what, I, concerned about eating fish because there's too much mercury, heavy metals, PCBs, dioxins, the fish is not handled well, it's rancid, so I'm going to go get some fish oil. And there's still problems with fish oil there, but they're trying to support this. They're trying to get those essential fatty acids in to preserve the integrity of that cell. As we have changed our food source. We have changed our cellular structure. And without those essential fatty acids, this beautiful, juicy grape that was our cell becomes shriveled. And it doesn't function as optimally. And as we pour in processed foods and sugars, in the extracellular matrix, our body is going to work very, very hard to get rid of all of it. All of the noise outside of those cells. And for those of you who know physics, there's a saying often that the solution to pollution is dilution. <sighs> the body will start pulling fluid from that intracellular space to the extracellular space to start diluting those toxins that are in our environment. That happens everywhere. And as those cells start closing in on themselves, they don't function optimally. In functional medicine, we study that cellular structure. We study those mitochondria, the powerhouses. And when we look at diseases, diseases are a myth. This might be a new concept to you all. Diseases are made up. They don't actually exist. What exists are mechanisms. What exists are constellation of symptoms that have been given the name of a disease. And then what we've done is we say, we have a drug for that disease, right? But think about it. One disease can be made up of many symptoms
and one symptom can cause many diseases. There are currently 12,000 classifications of disease in the medical books. They don't actually exist. What exists is the body trying to find balance. So my example to you all about that type 2 diabetic, Mr. Jones, who was eating the standard American diet, SAD, very sad indeed, was that he had some dysfunctions that were happening very early on. And one of my favorite quotes was from Maya Angelou. And she said, life speaks to us in whispers, and when you don't listen to those whispers, it starts screaming at you. Our bodies are speaking to us at all times. If we stop and we slow down and we listen, we'll be able to tell that there's some type of imbalance going on. There's an imbalance in the food supply. There's an imbalance in the body. So in my practice, I spend a lot of time with the individual getting to know the person, getting to know their personal story. Because disease doesn't start on one day that you walk into a doctor's office. It started years and years and years ago. That foundation that I spoke of when we introduced the pillars, the foundation has a crack in it. And disease is merely the structure built on top of that that is leaning. And we can bring in all of the duct tape <laughs> We could bring in the hammer and the nails. We could bring in the boards and we can buttress this system, that this structure that is on top of a broken foundation, but it's not going to be sustainable. And we're seeing that within the economics. We're seeing that in the fact that one out of two Americans will die of cardiovascular disease. Three quarters of Americans are overweight or obese. One out of three of us is pre-diabetic or diabetic. One out of five children have some type of mood or behavioral disorder. And one out of 10 of us will develop some form of dementia by the time we've reached the age of 65. This is not happening overnight. It's happening very slowly in our bodies, but we don't listen to it. And the current system of medicine puts the Band-Aids on, doesn't find that underlying cause. And we have to change that. When I get up on stage, I speak to primarily medical doctors who are very new at the concept of lifestyle medicine. As a naturopathic physician and nutritionist, I spent years making excuses for why I'm not a medical doctor. I spent years feeling as though, boy, did I make the right decision? Because maybe I'm not going to be taken as seriously. I have to tell you now, when I interact with other physicians, I am so sure that I made the right decision and that what we're all doing is true healthcare reform. Because we're not just addressing the symptoms, we're addressing the underlying cause. And for Mr. Jones, who went from being healthy to type 2 diabetes, to having a, an acute issue, the reason that happened is no one addressed the underlying cause. And most likely what that underlying cause was less than optimal food, not moving his body enough, not transforming his stress, and allowing all of that to get on top of him.
the standard best practices in medicine right now are on a prescription pad. And quite honestly, it needs to be on a grocery list. I went to a conference not too long ago, and there was a medical doctor from Harvard there speaking about the prescription of activity, the prescription of exercise, moving your body. And years ago, when he first started researching activity, he found some very interesting things out. The first, his colleagues thought he was absolutely insane. They said to him, you're spending all this time researching exercise, but if a patient walks into me and I write on a prescription pad, you need 20 minutes of exercise, they're going to come after me for malpractice. And he said, no, 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 no. They should come after you for malpractice if you don't prescribe exercise. Because if you look at the medical literature, there is not one drug out there. There's nothing out there that has over 250,000 thousand published articles in peer-reviewed journals that talk about the efficacy, the cost-effectiveness, and the safety, but exercise and activity does. Dr. Phillips did a very interesting survey of his colleagues, and he was looking at which of the doctors were prescribing activity and which were not. And for him, the results were not too surprising, and perhaps they won't be for you. What he found was that the doctors that participated in some type of aerobic activity, whether it be running, getting on a bike, just moving their body in a very fast pace, were more likely to recommend that type of exercise to their patients. The physicians and healthcare providers that participated in weight-bearing exercises, weight-lifting, core strengthening, they were more likely to recommend that to their patients. So I ask you, what do you think the doctors who don't participate in any type of physical activity recommended to their patients. <laughs> Not a lot. They didn't even talk about it. So what a missed opportunity. One of the things that I brought into the practice a few years ago is if I am going to recommend or prescribe something, I need to be able to monitor the effectiveness of it. And I also need a way of monitoring the individual's compliance with my prescription. Certainly with prescriptions, I can see when I last prescribed it, when they last refilled it, and hopefully be monitoring their, their progress. I found something, and I, I wear it all the time. It's called a kinetic activity monitor. And the most fascinating thing about this is that I am very aware of my physical activity, or so I thought. But I wake up in the morning before my kids so I can do some exercise, go to the gym perhaps on some days. I get back, I shower, I wake the kids, I get them to school, I get to the office, I park on the far end of the parking lot, walk up, take the stairs. I go back and forth with my patients to the front desk, getting them from the reception area, bringing them back to my office. I'm constantly moving. I get the kids home from school, I make dinner, I throw in a load of laundry. And I sit down at the end of the day, and I found out that I was actually barely moving. My perceived level of my own activity was so far off that I actually had to do more. With all of my patients, I don't talk about exercise because exercise is an event. It's something that happens or doesn't happen, as the case may be. 
But what we can talk about is living a more active lifestyle, moving your body, going to the bathroom on the second floor versus the one right down the hall from you. It's about making sure that you leave a little bit of extra time to take the stairs, to park further away, to do all of those things. Drink more water when you're sitting at your desk so that you actually have to get up and go to the bathroom more frequently. But the idea that we can actually change entire health outcomes by just moving our bodies, that is the most sustainable way. And for so many individuals, their perceived level of activity is so far off from what it actually is. For people who have altered body composition, who have less metabolically active tissue, the muscle mass, and more non-metabolically active tissue, their perceived level of activity is so far off that for some of them just getting off of the couch is perceived as a workout. So we give our patients a tool. And I encourage you all to find whatever your tool is that works. People often say to me, well, you know, Samantha, I'd love to work out more, but I just don't have any time to do that. And believe me, I understand being pressed for time. But one of the things that I started to do, and I'm going to get you all involved in this for the next few minutes, is I get home at the end of the day, and I'm cooking dinner for my kids, and I turn the music up, and we just start dancing. So I would like for you all to take a moment and get up. You've been sitting for long enough. Step out of your comfort zone with us, because as I told you all, I'm not a dancer. But stretch, feel your body. Don't get hung up too much in those cord, and just start moving. You gonna dance with me? might lose some people soon, but I might lose some people to it because they're uncomfortable. Yep.
We'll bring it down soon. Okay. We have more time than I probably need, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so thank you for participating in that with me. <laughs> I saw many different levels of comfort with dancing and moving your body, but my point is that activating, exercising can be a lot of fun. It doesn't involve a gym, it doesn't involve expensive equipment, it is just about doing. And I want you all to just sit for a moment now. Now I'm gonna join you. I have to say this is very different than any medical conference I've ever lectured at. <laughs> In a very good way. <laughs> but I also want to point out that we've moved on to the next pillar of the well-being. And that is transforming stress. I'll take this off again because it seemed to do the trick the last time. And talking about stress, oftentimes we talk about managing stress. And the word management seems very stressful to me. <laughs> we all have stress. And in fact, we've evolved because of stress and the way that we cope with it. And I don't think doctors spend enough time talking about stress, recognizing the importance of finding ways of dealing with stress. And as I was preparing for the Slow Living Summit, I have to say I was a little bit stressed. <laughs> and I was very mindful of what was happening in my body at that time. And so I would like to share with you some of the science behind stress so that you can think about how you feel and how your body identifies that you're in stress. There are five stages or five coping mechanisms for stress. Most people just think of the first two, which is fight or flight. And I will talk more about that in a moment. But the other three, is freezing, the deer caught in the headlights. There's feeding and fornicating. 
and I chose the right F. <laughs> and these five ways in which our body has adapted to stressful situations has, is what has enabled us as a species to survive. It's not a bad thing. But how we manage it, how we transform it, is important. So most of you are familiar with fight or flight. Let's walk through this for just a moment. We evolved so that if something was coming right at us, we would be able to decide whether we need to run away or fight. And very quickly what ends up happening is certain things shut down and other systems rev up. Those adrenal glands that sit on the tops of your kidneys squeeze out some cortisol and adrenaline. And those stress hormones have a physiological response in the body. Get the heart pumping. Well, if you're about to fight something or you need to run away, your body better be getting that blood flow to the lungs, to the muscles. You start breathing more rapidly. People feel short of breath. I can't catch my breath. I'm getting tightness in my chest. That's normal too. Because again, you need to oxygenate that blood again to get it to the muscles. Muscles get tight. You're needing to run or fight. Become very myopic. You can't focus on all of the other sounds. All you can think about is that one thing. You don't remember what you had to do later on. You don't hear the bird chirping in the background because everything else is tuned out. It's pretty normal. The problem with the way that we live our lives now is that the stressors are not the proverbial lion coming out at us anymore. It's the day-to-day -day stressors. It's the small things that build up. I forgot to mention the other response to stress is digestion shuts down. And the reason for this is that you really don't need to be digesting your food if you're about to be digested by the prover proverbial lion. And we see it with animals all the time. If they are in a fearful or excited state, if you have a dog, that dog might go off and just do its business and come back and say, okay, I'm ready now. And people do that too. They get nauseous or they have to go to the bathroom because digestion has shut down. So for all of you, what I want you to think about when I mention stress, what's the physical feeling that you have? Where does it go? Do you get tight shoulders? Are you sitting here now feeling your long day? Have you had a panic attack? Do you feel like you can't get that deep breath in? It's important to identify those because those are your body whispering to you, letting you know that you need to start paying attention. And when we talk about transforming stress, it's about an individual approach. Because what does it for me might not do it for you or you. I often joke that if someone told me that I had to wake up and go to a yoga class every day at 8 o'clock, that would be the most stressful thing for me in the world. But we're here at the Slow Living Summit weaving the art into the discussion. And to me, that is so profound because for so many of us, the arts are our expression of our stress. It is the way that we handle our stress. Listening to music, dancing, moving your body, doing your art. Tell me something else. What do you all do to, to transform your stress? Yell it out and I'll repeat it. Meditation. Write, sing, dance, alcohol. 
jokes, sense of humor. Cook, gardening. You see, for so many people, with this room, everybody has their different thing that they relate to to transform their stress. So for the well-being to be centered, we cannot address nutrition and activity without remembering to address stress. Because those hormones that are produced when we are living a fast and stressful life, they affect the cell. They affect everything about us. So yoga might not be your thing. Drawing might not be your thing. But find what is. And as we sit here, we can appreciate the artistic expression, the centering of the body. And I invite you all to become centered in your seat. Because the thing about transforming your stress, it's not about doing nothing. You have to do something to evoke the relaxation response. So people say, oh, well, I sat and I watched TV for two hours last night, so I'm fine. That's not transforming stress. Hot bath, I like that. So I am going to sit with you for a moment and ask you all just to briefly close your eyes, be a little bit vulnerable with me tonight and just feel your feet firmly planted on the ground. Get comfortable in your seat. Feeling your feet in your shoes. Feeling the weight with every breath, allowing your body to relax. Just continue to focus on your feet and the gravitational pull feeling heavy in your seat. And with each inhalation and exhalation, allowing your body to relax a little bit more. And when you feel that weight, slowly moving that energy up your legs to your calves and knees, Deep breath in, and all the way out. Focusing on your breathing. Allowing any thoughts that come into your mind to drift away. and being mindful of how your body feels. Allow your neck and shoulder muscles to relax. A 
let the stress of the day just drift away. Being in the moment and at peace. As you slowly start to open your eyes again and become more mindful of your surroundings and the sound of my voice, I want you all to remember that in order to be the well being, to be a human being, you can't always be a human doing. We all just need to slow down. Just enjoyed Samantha Eagle, Lyndall Hart, and John Sheldon. There they are, and their dirty, dirty feet. <laughs> and now, Samantha, would you like to um, take response or question? Do you want to? We have a couple more minutes left. We have about 10 I'm minutes left. I'm more than happy to answer questions. If that would be the right thing for everybody. And also, Lyndall and John. I mean, these guys are amazing human beings, too. So you may have questions about their <laughs> living slow. Yes. That has fortunately changed to some degree. That years ago, he had heard that doctors have the shortest lifespan, right. so about I'll 54. So I'll repeat the questions for you when okay, they come out. Perfect. There you go. So uh, doctors used to have the shortest lifespans. Do they now? I don't know the statistics on that. However, I am confident in that it's not 54. I do know that actually the profession that has one of the shortest lifespans is dentists. And they have one of the highest rates of suicide as well. And one of the remarkable things about that is that there is a connection between the exposure to heavy metals, mercury, and mental illness. And so, um, and yet, the American Association of Dentists still deny that there's any ill harm. But certainly, the dentists who have been handling these chemicals for years, I'm sure, would beg to differ. Another question? So, with cancer being so wide, a phen uh, widespread a phenomenon in this country, So slow down, sweetie. So what do you see between the connection of, um, what was it, over, do, doing too much? Uh, yeah, the sort of focus on production. Uh, oh, productivity and, and achievement and all that stuff. Okay, and what does that do to the cells? Quite. 
Right. Is that, yep. does, that, does that cover the question? There you go. Yeah, I can. I can uh, um, when it comes to any disease, as I mentioned, it's just a classification of many things that have happened leading up to that. And when we look at cancer, within our bodies, we have, as I mentioned, it's, it's estimated. We don't actually know what the numbers are, but estimated 37 trillion cells that are constantly dividing. And there are points in which there are mechanisms to keep that in check. Within all of us, there are cells that are not dividing optimally. And our body has certain chemicals to help um, meet, uh, mitigate that. When you start putting in all of these other factors, and cancer is a good example, um, because most of us have been touched by cancer in some way, shape, or form, we can look at the environmental impact, we can look at the nutritional impact, the stress impact, all of that changes the messages that are, those cells are getting, what we're bathing our cells in to create an environment where if the system is not being checked by um, certain chemicals, those cells will, will divide out of turn. So I don't know if I'm necessarily answering your question, but it is multifactorial, and obviously there's a correlation. Something in our, in our system is not working. We have a lot of, of what's, and by what I mean by that, we, we have a lot of diagnoses that have been approved, and we say, oh, thank goodness we have a diagnosis for this. This is wonderful. But the problem that I had, and why I actually went to naturopathic medical school, is that there weren't a lot of whys. And without asking that question and just putting a Band-Aid on the what, downstream, we see more problems. So does that, no, it doesn't answer the question. You're still looking at the, all the doing. The correlation between a society that is pushing itself to produce and the individual members of that society. So I, I can, okay. yeah. So I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting your question again, and we'll keep going. And you know, this is all about just communication, and um, so the seeming overgrowth of things because of doing too much and just producing, trying to produce more and more and more. Again, I, I think that cancer is so multifactorial that there's not just one thing, and there's more of a prevalence of it now because of many different things. It's, the, it's, it's not just one. And so the, the, the force to industrialize our meat source so that we can have more and less land that intensifies things, that's just one component of it. I would love to have that conversation with you a little bit more. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep, yeah, welcome. So one here and one here. Go ahead and pick. pick yeah. Go ahead. You speak a great deal about health on a micro level. To what degree is our health affected by macro level? Nuclear, radiation, yep, yep, cell tower, yep, she's got it now. Yeah. You know, 
It's amazing to me that um, when I was much younger, the focus was so much on um, the impact that humans have on the environment. I mean, that was the, 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 the beginning of the environmental movement is really like, let's go out there because we are impacting the environment. The pendulum's swinging now and we are recognizing how the environment is adversely affecting the human now. It, it is, it's kicking back. And um, so the, the entire field of environmental medicine, certainly functional medicine, looks at all of that. Um, there, there is an impact. Um, unfortunately, with many things, the research is often slow to come because of money. Where's the money coming from to do this research? The lobbyist groups, the pharmaceutical companies, that's generally where it comes from for medical research. This, the institutions are often tied with many different companies and interests, so we don't necessarily have all of the information. And with all medical research, we have to consider the source. So I'm, I get exhausted looking through the, the current published research that's out there, and people, the, the layperson is obviously confused by the information that they're being fed by the media because one day you're told don't eat eggs because there's too much cholesterol. The next day you're saying, they're telling you to eat eggs because it's actually okay. And you know my patients come in completely confused. And in fact, years ago when I was in college, it was when the low fat fad came up. That, and, and it has actually, I, I actually weighed 240 pounds in college. And I was eating low fat. I thought I was doing something good. Snack wells. <laughs> Do you remember those? <laughs> yes. I am not a vegetarian. And um, to be honest with you, when I was growing up and um, when the butcher shop around the corner from my parents' house closed and there was a big supermarket um, and we couldn't get locally raised um, grass-fed meats and sustainably raised meats, my family did become vegetarian. And um, for about 24 years of my life, I was a vegetarian, occasionally a vegan. Um, I'd go back and forth. Um, for me, personally, it was not optimal. And we live in a community where we can get very high quality meat. And I have to share this with everybody. When I was, uh, when I was in my 20s, um, and uh, uh, I think it was with my first child this happened, I actually was having a very hard time just nutritionally, and I started eating meat, and I started with chicken and turkey, and I started very, very slowly, and I basically knew the chickens. and. I, there was that point in which I had to go home to my family and let my parents know that I was eating meat. And so I went down to Long Island. I couldn't do this over the phone, of course. I went down to Long Island. I, <laughs> I sat them down. I said, Mom, Dad, I have something to tell you. <laughs> You've done a great job. You did nothing wrong but I need to let you know, I'm eating meat. <laughs> My mother, oh, please just tell me it's organic and humanely raised. Yes, mom, it is. What about the stress hormones? <laughs> Are they, are, they, are they stressed before they're going to slaughter? No, mom, it gives whole new meaning to chicken surprise. <laughs> They didn't see it coming. They were actually relaxed beforehand. <laughs> I don't make, I mean, I, I make light of it, and, and my family, we use humor a lot to deal with stressful situations. But I made a conscious decision, and part of that is supporting um, the, the farmers that I believe are doing it properly, um, and it's also right for my body. I have to say it's not right for everybody. Um, and I work with many individuals who um, are ethically opposed to it, but also whose body don't run well on it. So 
Um, it's an option. Um, we could have a whole conversation about gluten. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. One of the interesting things, just to let you all know, um, we're, we're actually uh, at Biologic, we have a newsletter that comes out, try to get it out every month, but we're doing a, um, a, an article on the prevention of Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases, um, which is incredibly prevalent in this community and, and in this region of the, the United States. Um, in the research, um, and I, I try to do the best that I can to stay up with the evolving research on uh, Lyme disease and its associated conditions, but there's something very interesting. And people, there are some people who have um, Borrelia, the, um, the Lyme disease, who actually become allergic to red meat. And I actually had one patient very recently who uh, came in and said, something's wrong. And she was no longer able, she was actually having a full allergy reaction to red meat. And it was because of Lyme disease. Off on a total tangent, just found it fascinating and wanted to share it with you all. <laughs> but. We have time for one more question, Samantha, if you want to take one more, sweetie. Oh, one more. Yep. Yeah. Thoughts on gluten intolerance. So there's a lot of information emerging right now. And, you know, what once was just a fad is now becoming, um, people are much more aware of it. The body can react to foods in very different ways. And um, people, you know, I, I'm going to run through this really quickly. And then the gluten conversation, there's some phenomenal books and resources out there that have the science. And I'll, I'll mention those right off the bat. One is Wheat Belly. And the other one, um, Dr. David Perlmutter, that came out within the past few months, is called Grain Brain. And um, I highly recommend both of those books. I, um, so the body can react to a food in a few different ways. One is that you can have a true allergy to something and your body produces something called IgE, which is that immediate anaphylactic type reaction. People could eat something over and over again or be exposed to something over and over again and on the 100th time, they can have an anaphylactic reaction. That's not as common with wheat, but it can happen. Delayed hypersensitivities are another way, where the symptoms associated with eating something are not as clear. So um, headaches, gas, bloating, muscle aches, um, joint pain, brain fog, those can be more of a delayed food sensitivity where the body produces something called IgG. And those circulate for up to three weeks. So you could eat something, and three weeks later, you're dealing with the effects of that food sensitivity. There's intolerances, and the best example that I could give is lactose. So your body doesn't produce enough of the lactase enzyme to break down lactose. And then finally, there is the autoimmune-type response, where your body actually produces antibodies to a component, a protein. And we are seeing more and more, it's not necessarily gluten, it's a much smaller molecule called gliadin. And over time, with the industrialization and with the changing in our food source, the amount of gluten in the food source has skyrocketed. And we're, I'm even talking about the amount of gluten and gliadin within a grain of wheat that amount has changed over time. And the reason for that, for one, is it is a protein. Two, it is a high commodity. It's added to a lot of things. And the more that we've had exposure to it, the more that our bodies have reacted to it. And the conversation, I mean, Dr. David Perlmutter does a phenomenal job, not just tying it into the standard um, uh, discussion about gastrointestinal health, but actually brain health. 
that you can have a gluten sensitivity, you can have those antibodies that pr produce so much of an imbalance that it actually changes brain chemistry, let alone everything else. So there is a true increase in individuals who are sensitive to gluten. And we see it in our stores. But again, one thing that I, I, I want to mention is if you're at a store and it has a nutritional label and a list of ingredients and a barcode, it's not real food. We have done so much to alter things. I'm going to say one more thing, and I, I would love to answer any other questions off of the stage after this. Um, and, and I also welcome you all. Um, my office is open for gallery walk on Friday night. I welcome you all to come up. We're just on Main Street, set back uh, in the Merchants Bank on the second floor. I'm hoping by this time next year I will have my building on Flat Street. <laughs> Long time coming, working on it. Um, but um, I was going to say something, and I thank you for the applause, by the way, for the building, yes. <laughs> brain, brain fog. <laughs> um, real food, labeling. Barcode. Boy, you guys are really good. Thank you. I wish you were with me at all times. Not really. Well, okay, give me one second here. Yep. See this? I actually haven't had any grain. <laughs> um, it was it was really profound, and it was going to be like the one thing that brought this all together for you, and it was going to be your aha moment. <laughs> I, someone dropped the thread. You know what? It will come to me. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm going to be handed the thread so I can try to bring it all back together again. Um, Hmm. Well, it's, it's definitely eluding me right now, and I apologize for that, so... Oh, wait, one more question. I have one more question. Oh, about the barcode, if it has a nutritional label. And thank you, now I remember what I was oh, going to say, go. see? <laughs> If it has a list of ingredients and a barcode, it's not real food. It's highly processed. It has been chemically altered. It's in a box. In a box. Um, so what I was going to say, and, 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 and it's really not that profound now that I think about it. It was just, <laughs> maybe I should just leave it. Um, but um, this past year, there was a great piece on NPR. And there was a woman who went to the American Dietetics Association annual conference. I recommend you all try to find this piece online somewhere. The thing that was remarkable was that she stepped away from that and she realized that the American Dietetics Conference was a fast food expo. And it was all of the companies that are all interconnected, as you may know, I'm sure you've seen that, that image of all of the mm -hmm. companies that are owned by a couple of companies. But they were trying to convince people, convince the nutritionists that are in our hospitals, that are in our schools, that this was nutritious food. Ketchup is a vegetable. Ketchup is a vegetable. There's a movie out by my colleague, Dr. Mark Hyman, and many other individuals, Katie Couric um, narrates it. It's called Fed Up. I would love to try to get it here in Brattleboro, and I'm sure if, I, if we were able to get it, Dr. Mark Hyman would even come and do it. So I plant that with you. And the other reference that I'd like to uh, recommend you all read is um, The Disease Delusion by Dr. Jeffrey Bland. And Dr. Jeffrey Bland is my mentor, he is the father of functional medicine, and it is a whole new paradigm. 
And the beautiful thing about this is that we've been talking about this paradigm shift for years and years and years. In medicine, we're actually starting to see it happen because the system is so broken and what we've been doing for so many years doesn't work and it's running out of money. And people look at me and say, well, you're a naturopath. I can't afford to go to a naturopath. Well, I got news for you. State of Vermont made it mandatory for all Vermont insurances to cover naturopathic medicine. I am a primary care physician. Medicare is federally funded, unfortunately. However, we are working hard at that. And the biggest reason for that is that for years we have been seen as an outlier to the medical system, that we are too costly, you don't really need that, because we have your drugs, we have your surgery. And while there's absolutely a time and a place for that, and believe it or not, I do prescribe pharmaceuticals, but it's not the end all to be all. But what we do by treating the underlying cause, by treating the individual, and not just caring for a patient, but caring for our patients and having care for them is more cost effective because we are able to stop Mr. Jones from not only becoming acutely sick, but actually reverting him back to wellness. It takes personal responsibility. I don't have a magic wand, but I can have a partnership with my patients. I can have the communication. No, bring that back. So thank you all very, very much. And on that note, we're so grateful for your partnership with us, Samantha Eagle. Thank you for your partnership with us tonight. Thank you, Lyndall Hart. Thank you, John Sheldon. What a beautiful night. What a great way to begin an amazing conference. Thank you, Orly Munzing. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.